Hi everyone, David Wood here with Brother Rashid. Brother Rashid, I'm sure you've noticed there are some there are some things going on right now. Really? Um, yeah. In Israel, mm -hmm. in Gaza, we've got Hamas. But one of the interesting things is that that little Hamas invasion where they went over, under, and through yeah. fences to go on a killing spree yeah. to massacre as many Jews as possible. They called this the Al-Aqsa Flood. Yeah. I'm sitting here looking at this, and I'm thinking, why why would they call it the Al-Aqsa Flood? What's that got to do with storming the land and killing men, women, and children? Yeah, um, they called it Al-Aqsa Flood. And it, if you go back to uh, the history of Hamas, all their operation, all their attacks, they call them religious names. For example, the Saif al-Quds, the, the sword of quds which is the same holy place. They call it al-Quds, Beit, Beit HaMikdash. It's like the holy site. Wait, 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 why would they give it religious names? You're saying this has something to do with religion? Of course it oh, has to do weird. with religion. So this whole massacre on October 7th, Hamas is claiming they are doing it for the sake of the mosque because Jews, every time they enter the mosque, they are unclean, they should not have been there. And remember the, the Intifada, the second Intifada started when Sharon entered the mosque. So the, for them, no Jew, no Christian should put his foot there because we are unclean and they are the clean ones. That's the first thing. Second, they own that place. They own it because Muhammad went on a night journey there. He tied his burak in the western wall and he ascended to heaven from where the Dome of the Rock is right now. He went there, he got the five prayers, he came back, he took his burak back and that's why they claim the ownership of that place. We need to dig into it. It starts from the Quran, chapter 17, verse 1. Exalted is he who took his servant, Muhammad, by night, so nobody can see him, from Al-Masjid Al-Haram, which is where Mecca is, to Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, that place. Note here. Back in the days, at the time of Muhammad, he called it Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa, but it was a Jewish site. Now they call Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa a Muslim site. Back in the days, during the time of Muhammad, no Muslim site existed. So the same name that Muhammad gave to the temple place, they used it to a mosque that Omar, his caliph, caliph in 13 Hijri, uh, uh, he went there, they invaded that area, they took over, he went, what is the best place to put a mosque? A Jewish site. So he took a Jewish site, he put his mosque there, now Jews cannot claim anything, even the Western world. Oh, yeah, that's where our prophet tied his burak, so it will not run away just in case somebody will take it and fly. So he tied it there. So the whole claim is absurd. Wait, wait a minute. So just to, be, just to be clear here, Muhammad takes his night journey. And you pointed out it's a night journey, so no one could see him. But uh, so how many witnesses are there in the Muslim sources of Muhammad flying his magic doggy, donkey monster to Jerusalem and... Uh, it doesn't matter for Muslims witnesses. It just... Just Muhammad said it. Said it? It must be. Muhammad said it. Yes. So th this is interesting. The same guy, the, the exact same guy who says to his best friend, hey, Abu Bakr, uh, I had a dream where Gabriel's giving your daughter to me. So yes. she's mine. Yeah. And then, of course, you have to you have to uh, uh, you, you have to hand her. He has to hand her over uh, the same guy who when he wants to expel the Banu Nadir, 
Yeah. Says, I had a dream. Gabriel has shown me that they're actually gonna gonna plot to kill me, and therefore we need to take we need to take their land and kick them out. This same guy who just keeps saying, I have a dream, I have a dream, this is mine, this is mine, everything is mine, just comes out one day and says, I had a dream, um, or I had a vision, or I'm taken there on the night journey, and then from that point on, Muslims think that that belongs to them. Yeah, and, this, and that's it. And they say Jews, they're just lying, there was no temple there. That's what... Everybody's saying in the Muslim world, they are just lying. We are saying the truth that belongs to us. And that's why Al-Aqsa is used by all Islamic factions in Palestine. For example, Hamas has a logo, for example, with Al-Aqsa Mosque on it. Uh, the Al-Aqsa Brigades, the name tells everything. Their satellite TV, it's called Alexa. Their radio is called Alexa. Everything is about Alexa. Why? Because they want all the Muslim world to join this war against Jews. The only thing they can do it to play the religious element. So this is a holy site. This is a holy war. These pigs and apes are trying to take our own holy site. The Second most important mosque in history, they say. It's where Muhammad prayed his first prayers towards that place. You, you remember that when he prayed, he tried to please the Jews, so he prayed towards Jerusalem. When they rejected him, he switched to Mecca. So they say it's very important. Well, it was if it was really important, why he switched? He just he, he didn't really care. Yeah, it's, it's always interesting how Allah's eternal revelations changed based on Muhammad's feelings when he's interacting with people. The first, the, the, the second intifada in, from 2000 to 2005, it was called Intifada al-Aqsa, the aqsa Intifada. It's made for al-Aqsa. Everything, we're sacrificing ourselves for this religious cause. So just to, just to be clear, you're saying that the reason they keep giving everything the Al-Aqsa label is, to, is for broader appeal to the Muslim community. Yes. That this isn't just us fighting you know, Jews to retain Gaza or something like this or to get more independence for Palestinians in Gaza or something like this. It's no, we are on a mission for one of our holiest sites right now. Yeah. This is why everyone needs to, needs to be behind us. It's a holy war, it's jihad. You have to join us. If, our, if you are a Muslim in Pakistan, it's your duty to defend your holy sites. So do you want to make it like that? I, I just want to point here that when Arafat started, before Hamas, you know Hamas came in 87. Their logos, their speeches, no mention of Al-Aqsa. They didn't care. They were just a secular movement. They were doing what Che Guevara was doing and others, they were just imitating those movements. But when Hamas came, after the, the Iranian revolution, and after the oil money started pouring to them, it became so religious about everything is around the Al-Aqsa. And that's when they started changing their logos and making these groups, Al-Aqsa Brigades, Hamas, it's the, the, the Islamic resistance it's not called just resistance. It's the movement of a, a Islamic movement resistance, the, the abbreviation, that's what it says. So they are trying to make it a religious war against the Jews to convince Muslims in the West, Muslims in the East, Muslims everywhere to join this Hermageddon uh, war so we can kill the Jews, get rid of them, get our holy site back. It does seem to work as far as, it's uh, as, far as getting, getting people involved. Yes. It's, it's working. And then, you know, there is a slogan among all Muslim leaders. Soon we will pray in Al-Aqsa. So it's, it's like what's holding them from praying there is the Israelis occupying that land. Knowing that Israel allows every Muslim in Israel 
to pray there. They have no problem with it, except if you start using it to stone them, then they, they, they intervene. Mm -hmm. But besides that, you can pray anytime there. You can do your Friday prayers, and we have seen it on TV. Thousands of people go there. They are not really against against uh, uh, praying there. It's, they are against, and actually, they are, sometimes they give sermons against the Jews, even in that mosque. So Muslims control the mosque. Muslims can go to the mosque. Yes. Muslims can pray in the mosque. They give sermons in the mosque. But Muslims are saying, we've got a religious war. We've got to liberate this from the control of the Jews. Yes. Just because there are some Jews in the area who have some say so in certain situations over what goes on in case there's a, a rebellion forming or something like that, then they'll step in. But that's too, that's too much for Muslim, uh, Muslims around the world. You can't even have that. Yeah, because Jerusalem is now the capital of uh, Israel. They consider it the, the, the capital of Israel and Muslims, they don't want that. Jerusalem for them is the holy city, is Al-Quds. They don't call it even Jerusalem, they call it Al-Quds. It's our holy city. And, and if uh, let's, let's dig into uh, history a little bit, how this started. Muhammad went there, he claimed, night journey. Muslims had no say on that land. Jews and Christians lived there. So there, there are no Muslims there at this point? No Muslims. Okay. After he died, Abu Bakr took over, he died, then Omar, they, they say they conquered that land, they call it Fath, they opened that land. Actually, they surrendered to them because they were attacking them, they were killing them, so they surrendered the whole city to them. Omar went there, from day one, he wanted to build a mosque. That's how they conquer a place. And he chose where Jews had their masjid their prayer place, they said, there. He said, that's where I'm going to put the mosque. So he put the first mosque. After 70 years, Abdul Malik Ibn Marwan comes. He's ruling a majority Christian city. He's seen all these beautiful churches with domes, and their mosque looks ugly. And they were, he was like, uh, everybody's like liking these. And until now, if you go there, you see the beautiful churches, the beautiful buildings, everything. And he was like, no, it can't be like this. We need to have a beautiful building like this. So he got the Dome of the Rock in the middle where the Holy of Holies used to be. Because we still have remains of that, of, of the temple. And if you remember in the Hadith, Muhammad was asked questions, how does it look like? Because the, the polytheists, they knew, they traveled there. Mm -hmm. So they knew it was ruins, but yeah, there are no remains. Clue. Yeah, he had no clue. He had no clue. Okay, you flew last night there on your weird donkey? Well, tell us how it looks like. So this is actually, we can actually verify, right? We, yeah. we, can, te we can test his claim to have actually traveled there. If I say, "Hey, I was just taken on a, uh, I was just taken on a on a magic donkey or something like that to, uh, let's say Morocco." Yeah. If I say Morocco, I visited I Morocco, Morocco, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll say, "Can you tell me how yeah, it looks and like?" Yeah, and then I have no clue what I'm talking about. You'd be like, "Okay, I don't believe you." <laughs> but that's what happened to him. Actually, when he he said Gabriel took the mosque, the Jewish mosque, because uh, uh, the word mosque used to be. Uh, given to any place you a place of worship, so it's not really uh, uh, just for Muslims. That's why he called it Masjid Al-Aqsa. It's the the place where you bow down. Masjid is from Sajid, from the place where you bow down. That's it. So anyway, so the Hadith says Gabriel put the mosque in front of me, and I was describing it. There was no mosque; just ruins, nothing. That tells you the story was, was either made up late with, because they built the mosque or he told them some, some lies and they were laughing at him. One yeah, of so the either he's lying yes. or other people who came after him lied and then made up the lies about it. So Abdul Malik bin Marwan, he was jealous and he said, I need a beautiful mosque. Looks like a church. Um, some sources say actually he stole that dome from other churches. 
We don't know for sure, but 100% he was imitating churches in that area. And then he built this mosque. And guess what? Inside of it, all the verses that refute Christian doctrines in Jesus, all of them is, are about Jesus. So he, he will say, this is the true mosque, the true masjid. And that's why Muslims, they started now making that place holy. Note that he took a Jewish site. They claimed everything in it. They took over that place. They invaded. It's by force. And now they say Jews have no right there. So this is the, the base of the whole story of this conflict. And this is uh, going back to the idea of Muhammad could just say he got a, a dream or a vision or something like that. And then this, according to Muslims, mean that that, that then belongs to them for forever. You just see he, he kind of has this obsession with taking, taking over people's holy sites. So yeah. he takes over the Kaaba. That's a pagan center of worship. And he yeah. can just say, hey, um, actually, Abraham and Ishmael built this. And so therefore, I'm the best one to control yeah. this place now. He can say, I was taken on a... Uh, on this uh, flying donkey to Jerusalem. I was taken there, so that actually belongs to me, even though my descriptions of it are completely wrong. But it's the same principle, I mean, H Hagia Sophia. Yes, that was, exactly, that, the that same was, thing that, I was, was going to mention. Yeah, that was, that was that's, I mean, that's the, heart, that's the heart of the Christian world at this point, to have that, uh, that massive church right there. Uh, now it's a mosque. Yeah. Now it's a mosque. And so it, it, it's always interesting to me that the rules only apply in one direction. Yeah, because if, if today you were to take over a mosque and turn it into a church, Why? it would be international <laughs> news and it would be this is wrong. This is immoral. We condemn this. This is the worst thing ever. Islam has been doing that for 14 centuries, taking over places of worship. You know what's worse? There is a lie circulating around the Muslim world since I grew up and still I see it until today. It says that Jews are digging and under the, the, the Dome of the Rock so they can make it fall down so they can build their temple. I went there, I checked, I went there, they are digging, but not under that. They're digging around because all Israel is history. Yeah. And they, have, they are digging almost everywhere. They are finding old kingdoms, they are finding artifacts, they are finding yeah, coins. I, I was there and they were finding the outer wall of, of what was David's palace. Exactly, because, but they are doing it in a professional way with people who know that stuff. They are not trying to destroy anything. For them, everything, Christian, Muslim, Jew, is uh, a, a capital, an, a, a cultural capital for them. Tourists will come everywhere. Christians will go there, will see their churches. Muslims can go there now, especially from United Arab Emirates and other places. From Morocco, they can travel there. They can see their holy places. Everybody can see their holy places. Guess what? In Israel, the Baha'is, for example, they are persecuted in every country but they have the best temple you can see in the world in Israel. Nobody's trying to destroy it. Muslims, they have mosques everywhere actually in, in Israel. And they are preaching that Jews are pigs, sons of pigs and apes and Israel is protecting them. Nobody's attacking them. Give me one synagogue in Gaza. Give me one synagogue in the West Bank. They will destroy it next day. Even in the Muslim world, they are not protected. They cannot have one in, in, in many Muslim countries. They will be attacked. So Israel, is, it's not in their interest to destroy anything. They are just trying to preserve what is there already and also dig to find their history. And, but there is a rumor. They are trying to destroy it so they can build the temple again and they can destroy our, and so they can incite other Muslims to join this holy war. And so you talked about the rumors. These are the same rumors where uh, Israel is, uh, Israelis are poisoning the water with uh, sex hormones to turn the young girl, to make the young girls uh, want to uh, go commit fornication. And uh, Israel is training 
birds and snakes and so on to be spies and to go and bite people and so on. So there, yeah, there are always, always conspiracies going on. So you're, you're pointing out that this particular rumor is meant to uh, make Muslims globally concerned that yeah. if they don't act now, if they don't do something, yeah. uh, Jews are going to dig under there. It's just going to swallow up the, uh, it's going to swallow up Al-Aqsa Mosque, yeah. and then so they can rebuild their temple. So you yeah. gotta, you have to act now, or or it'll be too. Oh, late it will be wrong. too late. And and uh, actually, just just in these recent attacks by Hamas, Khalid Mishal, uh, one of their, uh, he's a former leader, but he still has a uh, power over the, the the group. He just went on TV and he said they are trying to um, destroy the the Al-Aqsa Mosque to build their temple. And he said again, just in 2023. Now, isn't this interesting? Because it seems like Israel could take the Al-Aqsa Mosque in like 10 minutes. If in a second. Yeah. And it, it just exploded like one bomb and we're done. And they could, they could have used the, the most recent attack of Hamas as the justification. They should say, hey, they're calling this the Al-Aqsa flood. We can't keep living like this. We're taking the Al-Aqsa Mosque and... And uh, and and we, we just we just we just can't have them attacking us based on these things. Could have taken it right there and been done with it, but it doesn't seem like they're actually trying. Nothing prevents them from doing anything to it. They can put a bomb there and say somebody else put it there and explode the whole thing. They can do many things. Uh, you know, they 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 have authority there. It's in their and they're there their authority. They can do anything, but they are not because they are they are as any other state in the world. They are trying to protect their 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 uh, culture, whatever, with all religions together. They have the Rus, they have the Baha'is, the Ahmadis actually are most protected in Israel than any other Muslim country. They have the Christians, they have the Muslims, and of course atheists, agnostics, Jews. They don't care about this stuff. Actually, it's a secular state. They will be like, as long as you respect each other, as long as you don't harm each other, everybody's welcome to have his own religion here. And so the, the theory of lots of Western college students and journalists and so on is, uh, well, if you just take that place where you've got Muslims, Jews, Christians, other groups, I mean, you, you, can, you can walk through Jerusalem, you hear the call to prayer, the Islamic call yeah. to prayer over loudspeakers and stuff like yeah. right, right there in Jerusalem. The idea is, um, we'll just hand that over to Hamas and then problems will be solved. Exactly. And tell me how many Christians now live under Hamas, how many Baha'is, how many Druze, how many, how many other religions. Uh, if, if somebody converts to Christianity now under Hamas, somebody like me, he will be killed before... Uh, I mean, the, the, the same day. And, and people are, uh, got killed actually. Christians and converts got killed in Gaza just because they left Islam. It's, it's like ISIS, it's like Al Qaeda. It's now no different if you read Hamas charter about like what the, what's their plan. It's an Islamic state where they will apply Sharia and Muslims and, and Christians and Jews have to live as dummies. Other religions, they have no right to exist because they are excluded from that. But uh, Christians and Jews have to pay jizya in order to live in their Islamic state. So if, let's say, we give that whole country to Hamas, we will have an ISIS state. And so you, you, have, um, you have calls within Islam for jihad, of course, you have commands to violently subjugate the entire world. Muhammad said that he'd been shown in a vision, another one of his famous visions, said he saw the east of the east and the west of the west, and he saw that all was under the control of Islam. So Islam is actually going to subjugate the world. If you're uh, a Hindu or an atheist or something like that, the options for you are going to be convert or die. If yes. you're a Christian, uh, or a Jew, you're supposed to have the option to become dimmies. Depends on how enraged the Muslim community is at you. I'm not sure they would be giving uh, Jews the, uh, the, the option of becoming dimmies at this point. Uh, but in theory, they're supposed to have the option to become uh, dimmies. But the, the overarching goal is always the subjugation of the world. Yes. But you have local groups who understand, hey, this is my part of it. 
Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm not fighting in Pakistan. I'm right here. This is my job. Yeah. And you're saying, like, the like a group like Hamas, they have the same goal as a group like ISIS. They're just in a different area with a different job that they have. Our yeah. job, our job is to is to conquer Israel and yeah. make it an Islamic state there. Yeah. They, they believe their first fight is there. Other fights will come later. And there was a saying, actually, among um, many Islamic groups, today is Saturday, tomorrow is Sunday. So we will start with the, the Jews, Jews first, we'll go to the Christians next. And then this, is, this was famous. So again, it's a religious war. So using Al-Aqsa as uh, um, a rallying cry. Yes, something that will gather all Muslims. Remember, Hamas is a Sunni group. Hezbollah, which is helping Hamas, is a Shia group. Iran is a Shia state. Qatar is a Sunni state. But they all gathered, you know, Shia and Sunni, they killed each other over uh, through history. Mm -hmm. The, the, from, from, the, from the first generation. From the first generation. And Muhammad said that, Muhammad was asked, what's the best generation of Muslims? <laughs> he said his generation. His generation, you had Aisha, the mother of the faithful, march an army out against Ali, the commander of the faithful. There were Muslims on both sides of this battle who had fought alongside Muhammad at Badr and Uhud. Yes. And now they're slaughtering each other in the name of Allah. Yeah. And that's the best generation. This is why it's so, it's, it's so difficult nowadays to say, hey, Sunnis and Shias, stop fighting and so on. You guys stop fighting when, wait a minute, the best generation almost annihilated itself killing each other. And yet even this group, 14 centuries of fighting between Sunnis and Shias, and there's one thing that will unite them. Yes, exactly. So they united. You know, they killed each other. They hate each other. Until now, they celebrate the death of Aisha, the Shia. They celebrate the death of Aisha. They call Abu Bakr and, and Omar. They call them um, thieves and, and liars and, and, and bloodsuckers and all kind of names. But they all came together against Jews because the enemy of my enemy is my friend. So we become brothers. Let's help each other get rid of the Jews. Let's not look at our differences. Qatar is funding them, hosting their leadership. Even they are Sunnis and uh, Hezbollah is helping them, even if he is Shia. Uh, Iran is helping them with weapons and training, even if they are Shia. For them, the most important thing is let's try to get rid of the Jews of the state of Israel. Let's get back Al-Aqsa Mosque. Let's unite, uh, unite um, uh, for this holy reason first and solve our differences later. Yeah, and uh, lots of groups seem to have that same mentality. It, it kind of reminds me of like the uh, LGBTQ against Islamophobia, right? <laughs> like, <laughs> hey, let's unite now and settle our differences later. Well, and they are supporting now the free Palestine. Mm -hmm. And I'll be like, uh, we are welcome to live under Hamas jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just try it then. <laughs> Matter of fact, just, just, go, just go spend a month there and then come back and tell us. Uh, if you can come back. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, so here, here we have this situation where what people hear today is this is a political issue. There's a, a persecuted, oppressed group of freedom fighters who are simply responding to an invasion of Jews that took over their land and they're trying to get it back. Um, total nonsense. That's not what happened at all. Uh, there were always Jews there. There were always Jews there. And there was no Palestine, Palestinian group. It was part of the Roman, I mean, it was part of the Ottoman Empire. Yeah. Ottoman Empire uh, gets defeated and the nations in control agree that, that Jews should have some land on there that they control themselves because the other groups want to exterminate them. Yeah. And so that, but then it gets spread into a myth that Jews just moved there and kicked people off their land. Not what happened, but it gets represented as this sort of political, just political situation. You're pointing out that for Muslims, it actually has this, it's a religious issue. And in order to rally people around their cause, they appeal to the religious issue. And the real basis in Islam for them controlling this land is Muhammad stepping out one day and say, hey, I flew on this magic donkey and it took me there. 
Yeah. I'm going to describe the place for you. And those of you who have been there, you'll know I have no clue what I'm talking about. And therefore, I really didn't go there. Yeah. But nevertheless, you can't say that because you'll get your head chopped off in Islam if you say, no, Muhammad was wrong. He didn't actually yeah. go there. And so that's why we have all these problems going on right now. Because 14 centuries ago, the most obvious false prophet in history said, hey, I just got a dream of this place or a vision or whatever. Uh, but now that's, now that's ours and we got to fight forever. And imagine, like, people who have um, every stone there cries, there was a temple, there was a Jewish presence there. Every stone you go there, it will show you that. They, are, they, are, um, they have no rights there, but the ones who had just one dream, one vision, they have the right there. It's just like so absurd, so nonsense. Even today, Hamas, for example, the guys who are, who are um, carrying the attacks, each one of them, when he dies, they call him the martyr so-and-so, the martyr Muhammad, the martyr Ahmed, the martyr uh, whatever. You just add the martyr. Today, the martyr win. Because the... The, the, they have been taught this is a religious war. When you die for this cause, you go to your 72 uh, versions. Basically, I just showed that they don't go straight to the 72 versions. They stay in a stomach of a green bird waiting for the end days until that happens. They are just waiting in the waste of uh, inside a stomach and uh, the birds are flying all over the place with the martyrs inside. It's a weird concept, but I think they deserve to be there, like where, where uh, all the, the, the stuff inside them, yeah. they, they deserve that place. But anyway, going back to the topic, they are calling them martyrs because it's a religious war. Whoever dies, even Hezbollah right now, he just sent a, a, a statement, said from now on, Everyone who died during these days of the attacks, we should put in the, um, the, the martyr of Al-Aqsa. He died for Al-Aqsa. So they added to every person who dies from Hezbollah's side. It just shows you they are declaring a religious war on Israel. And uh, lots of people don't understand the, the psychological uh, impact these teachings have on Muslims. Yes. Uh, Muhammad said in the Quran he didn't know what Allah was going to do with him. Yeah. He didn't. He, and, and this is in the context. This is even in the context of salvation. The the hadith that's connected to that. Um, uh, a, a a Muslim Uthman, different Uthman, not the Caliph Uthman, uh, but a Muslim named Uthman dies, and then a woman says, "Oh yes, he's blessed. He's blessed in paradise now." And Muhammad's like, "What are you talking about?" She's like, what do you say? Muhammad is one of the best Muslims. He's one of the very best Muslims. If, if he's not going to paradise, if we can't say he's in paradise. Who, what can we say? And Muhammad says, uh, look, I, I'm the prophet and I don't know what Allah is going to do with me. Yeah. So you don't have a lot of assurances of, of salvation in Islam. Except if you're a Except martyr. if you're the martyr. Yeah. And so if you're, no, notice from, a, from just a psychological perspective, if you're a Muslim growing up and you've done all kinds of things and you're, you're hoping you, you get to paradise, but... Wait a minute, even Muhammad, even Muhammad didn't really know, according to the Quran, what's going to happen to him. You have all these other Muslims, and they didn't know what Allah is going to do with them. And even a really, really great Muslim, Muhammad says, you don't know what's going to happen to him. What assurance do you have unless you go out and die as a martyr? And yep. then all of a sudden, that, then you know you're good. You know you're going there. You know you're getting your virgins. And so all you have to do, all you, the, the, the shortcut, the shortcut is just go die while attacking Jews. Yes. And that's it. Yeah, I think the conclusion of this war, um, the West looks at it different. They think it should be solved. Two states, mm -hmm. one next to each other, they will, live, they will live peacefully. I think that's a wishful thinking. As long as this conflict is seen by Muslims as a religious war over holy sites, and as a religious war against the Jews, because they have no right to own a Muslim land, I think no solution will work for Muslims except um, killing all the Jews or, or sending them somewhere. That's the solution they will accept. So 
What's the solution from our side is to refute this narrative, to raise generations that they can coexist with Israel. They, can, they, can, they shouldn't go back to Islamic texts. They are not the standard uh, of their lives. They should get rid of these things. If we don't break these narratives, I think this, this conflict will go for generations to come. So this is why we expose false prophets. Yes. Lots of there, false prophets come and false prophets go. People claim to speak uh, for God, and sometimes you know they die and then they just go away. Uh, Muhammad's teachings have been influencing a lot of people for 14 centuries. A uh, lot of violence, a lot of bloodshed, and uh, as you've explained, this is viewed as a religious war, and it's a religious war that's going to continue. Until people's faith in Muhammad is, is shaken. Yes. And the best way to do that, ladies and gentlemen, is to study the life of Muhammad. Uh, you, you, can, you can learn one important fact about Muhammad and just share that as much as possible. Uh, but uh, I would encourage you, I would encourage you, if this is a topic you're interested in, learn some basic information about Muhammad and start spreading it. Because notice, even if people just know, if people just know what the real basis of even the recent conflict is, um, if people just knew the facts about how Israel's formed, if people know understand what is actually driving Hamas, as opposed to uh, what people are saying is driving Hamas. If people learn any of that, they can expose a lot of the lies. But at the end of the day, we have to expose Muhammad. Uh, if, he's the, if his claim to, to fly into to Jerusalem on a flying donkey is the source of all this bloodshed, and here we are centuries later, people are still being slaughtered over this, uh, comes, I, I think it's time, now, now more than ever, to expose the most obvious false prophet in history and will save a lot of lives.